Well, hello once again, uh, Pastor Wayne Hathaway here with you in our study in the Book of Romans, some good seeds, the Friday night study. Glad to have you with me, uh, whether it's Friday night or not. Just glad that you've taken the time to spend with me in the Word of God. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Book of Romans, chapter five. We're going to be looking at verses twelve through fourteen, and the subject, the subtitle of this message is "Ruined by Sin." And so we are talking about in a basically about a three-part series here as we are going through this verse by verse about reigning in life and pray that it will be a blessing and a help to, to each one of us as it is a help to me too. All right, let's begin in Romans chapter 5 verses 12 through 14. In, 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 all, in all of the reading that I've done on this passage, most commentators agree that it's one of the greatest theological sections in the Bible. And I, I agree with that. I've, I, well, I've been just blown away by uh, chapter 5 altogether. Uh, because here now in this study, in 10 short verses, Paul summarizes uh, the theology, uh, basically, of the, of the previous four and a half chapters. He summarizes the lostness of mankind and the subsequent rescue through God's wonderful provision. It also is commonly agreed by most commentators that I've read that this is this passage, verses 12 through 21, is one of more one of the more difficult passages in Romans, if not the entire Bible. And again, I have to agree. So what I want to do, what I want this evening to to do, is simply as if possible to teach without uh, teach this passage without oversimplifying it. Uh, the truths themselves are wonderfully simple when we accept them in simple faith in the Word of God. For example, uh, I don't fully understand the law of gravity, but I'm, I am, however, quite, quite content to live within the parameters and accept its influence in my life. Not everything in God's word is easy for us to understand, and so we must therefore accept it by faith and rest in what it says, knowing that one day God is going to make it all clear to us. It's not only that uh, any of God's truths are unexplainable, but that the explanations of many of them, I think, are really beyond our comprehension. Our responsibility is to accept by faith both what is clear and what is not, what is comprehensible and what yet remains a mystery. We accept it on the basis of the character and the nature of the one who wrote it, and so uh, we take it by faith. So when we come to this word, therefore, of verse 12, uh, that basically kind of sets the stage for the passage that we're going to look at. What he now shares is not some uh, isolated intrusion into what precedes or what follows, but, it, it, you know, we have to just follow Paul's logical mind, the Holy Spirit speaking through him, logically developing what he is presenting to this point and a transition then to what is going to follow. Uh, the passage divides, uh, for at least my benefit, I try to look at it that way, uh, into three short paragraphs in which uh, each of them, uh, Adam and Christ, are related to each other and uh, compared to each other uh, with the significant differences that there are between the two. Uh, first, in verses 12 through 14, Adam and Christ are introduced. Adam is responsible for sin and death and, and as a pattern for the one, Jesus, who is going to come. Then we will discuss uh, this under the heading the ruin of sin. Secondly, in uh, verses 15 through 17, Adam and Christ are contrasted. In each of these three verses, the work of Christ is said to either uh, be uh, not like Adam or much more successful than Adam. We will look at that under the heading of next time, uh, rescued by a savior. And then finally, we're going to see Adam and Christ further compared in verses 18 through 21. And we'll see the difference in the structure uh, here from verses 15 and 17. Uh, all of this under the, the heading of the reign of grace. Uh, though, uh, you know, the title sounds kind of, uh, at the outset, uh, kind of negative, the ruin of sin. There really is a positive progression in this that I want us to see. Paul begins with man's ruin and moves on to his rescue and ultimately to his reign. Uh, the problem is that oftentimes many of us are uh, not reigning as we are intended to reign in life. Uh, like the Philistine king that's described in Judges chapter 1, verses 4 through 7. Uh, he had his thumbs and big toes cut off. And though he was still a Philistine king, he couldn't, he could no longer function as a king. He couldn't hold a scepter or a sword. He couldn't march across the kingdom into battle. 
Uh, he was reduced to awkwardly uh, kind of tottering about looking for scraps from underneath the table. And I think with that illustration in mind, some of us too no longer live like the children of God that we are. And I'm not talking about some, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, what do I call it? Uh, 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 you know, we're king's kids, I guess. Is that's the thing I'm trying to like, you know, where we are in health and wealth and we reign like king's kids and we demand this and demand. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about a biblical perspective on how we are to reign in life and what that looks like. And uh, so uh, my prayer is, is that in this passage, God's going to help us and, and restore what has been lost and that we will truly reign in life as we are intended to, as, a, as the Bible talks about. So today we're going to begin this series uh, of messages within the context of going through the book of Romans verse by verse with our first message entitled Ruined by Sin. And so four points that we're going to look at today, the entrance of sin, the effect of sin, the extension of sin, and then the evidence of sin. So as I said, verse uh, verse twelve, the therefore of that verse connects what has what fo- what is going to follow with what has gone before. And so, first of all, as believers, we have been reconciled by God uh, to God by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. And so now Paul begins the analogy of Christ and Adam and shows how death and life come through the two individuals to all men. So we start with the entrance of sin in the first part of verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world. So let's let's talk first of all about when and where sin originated. It's important to note at the outset that Paul does not say that sin originated with Adam, only that sin in the world entered as into the human realm and that it began with Adam. Sin originated with Satan. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 14, Satan said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. John 1 John 3, 8 says that Satan has sinned from the beginning. John doesn't specifically say when that beginning was. However, it had to have been before Adam and Eve were created. So after God placed Adam and Eve in the garden, he commanded Adam to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For he says, in the day that you eat from it, you shall surely die. Now we know from Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 and 7, Adam and Eve sinned when they ate from the fruit of the tree. So God gave Adam one simple prohibition. By ignoring God's commandment, Adam brought severe consequences upon himself and all mankind. Although Eve disobeyed first, the primary responsibility for the sin was Adam's. First of all, because it was to him that God directly gave the command. Secondly, He had headship over Eve. In other words, he could have insisted on their mutual disobedience, rather. He could have insisted on their mutual obedience to God rather than let her lead him into disobedience against God. That one command was the only point of submission to God that was required of Adam. He had been given authority to subdue and rule the entire earth. But when Adam disobeyed God, sin entered his life and generated a change in his nature. Paul's argument begins with that assertion that, though through Adam, sin entered the world. He doesn't say sins plural, but sin singular. So he isn't talking about unrighteousness as an act of some kind, but but as the one author points out, inherent propensity to unrighteousness. He's talking about that intent, not the act. So it's, it's not about the other unrighteous acts that Adam committed over his life, but Paul is talking about the sin nature that he came to possess as a result of his first disobedience. You see, that is what Adam passed on to his posterity. The result of that one act of disobedience is just as Adam passed on his physical nature to his posterity, he also passed on his spiritual nature. The result of which is that from that time forth, all mankind is characterized and dominated by sin. It's a, it's a difficult concept for us to swallow. Our, uh, our me-centered culture makes many reject, with, with little thought, the idea that we could possibly share in Adam's sin. Hard enough for people to take responsibility for their own sin. So then Adam is portrayed here as what is called 
the federal head of the human race or the representative of all those who are in the old creation. So the fact that Adam and Eve were historical figures is crucial to Paul's argument here. The fact that all humanity descended from them is absolutely critical as well. The reason is that Paul, as he is arguing here, if it seems so out of whack to some people's thinking that they sinned in Adam, how then could the entire race also be redeemed through the actions of one man, Jesus? You see the connection in that? If an, historic, if an historical Adam did not represent all mankind in sinfulness, a historical Christ could not represent all mankind in righteousness. That's the Paul, that's Paul's logic in this. If all mankind did not fall with Adam first, all men could not be saved in Christ second as the last Adam. That's his reasoning in this. And so from that comes then the effect of sin. Here's the plan. God did not create Adam as a mortal being that is subject to death. He did warn him about death should he disobey. Should he disobey, that disobedience would make him subject to death. With the entrance of sin, the effect then of sin was universal. Everyone dies. In Adam, all die. The wages of sin is death. All have sinned, therefore all die. You see the logical explanation of that. So we die not because of sins, but because we have a sin nature. A person doesn't tell a lie and become a liar. He lies because he has a deceitful heart. The outward only reveals what is on the inside. So here's the problem that is brought about by sin. Death. First of all, spiritual death. That means separation from God. Adam and Adam immediately felt the effect of his sin. Unbelievers are separated from God. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 and 18 says this. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. No matter how much an unbeliever wants to think that they might have in terms of, of some kind of a relationship with God, there is none. They are separated from the life of God due to the sin that is in them. They are, so, they are very much alive in the world, but they are dead to God and to the things of God. The natural man, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Secondly, then, there's also physical death. In Adam, all die. It's the ultimate statistic. 100 out of 100 people die. Or you could say one out of one. It's the fact that every one of us dies. Separation from our fellow human beings. We've all felt the sting of death in this way. We hurt when we hear reports daily of human tragedy, of separation brought about death. We hurt with the death of loved ones, people we know, we are concerned about, we feel that. So that is the, that is the second aspect of that. And then finally, there's eternal death, not only spiritual and physical, but eternal death. It's referred to in scripture as the second death. This is an, this is an immeasurably worse extension of the first. Not only brings... Uh, uh, spiritual death not only brings separation from God, but eternal death brings eternal separation and torment in hell. And, and, and the unbeliever has reason to fear all three of these. Spiritual death prevents knowing the fullness of God as, as God intended for man. That's not God's heart for mankind. God wants for all mankind to know him. Physical death ends in every opportunity for salvation. Eternal death will bring about everlasting punishment. Praise God. No kind of death has to be feared by those who know the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. Praise the Lord. We are saved from spiritual and eternal death. One day we are going to be ushered into his glorious presence, whether by physical death or at the rapture of the church. But we have this hope. We have no fear then of death. Let's talk thirdly then about the extent of sin. Second part of verse 12. Therefore, just as through uh, one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because of sin. 
let me just say that Paul doesn't attempt to explain here to make an explanation of wholly understandable. He didn't claim himself to have full comprehension of comprehension of the significance of, that God revealed to him. He simply declares it. Scripture supports it. Our depravity bears witness to the truth. We don't, for example, we don't have to we don't have to teach our children to disobey, to lie, and to be deceitful. David said in Psalm 51, verse 5, that, that we are brought forth in iniquity. Psalm 58, verse 3 says that the wicked are estranged from the womb. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 says, the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So there are only, there are only two possible positions in the world. You are either a child of God or you're a child of the devil. Those are the only two options. You're either in God's kingdom or Satan's kingdoms. You either serve God or you serve sin and self, Satan. To serve self and Satan is to not be surrendered to Jesus, which means you are, whether you want to, a person wants to acknowledge it or not, controlled and dominated by Satan. That's, those are the only two choices, the only two options. You can do that, be like that, live in church, give, sing, and a host of other kind of Christian things, but still be not in the kingdom. In John chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus was addressing the religious leaders of his day, and he said to them, you are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So that's, that is representative of all of those who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. They are not in God's kingdom. They are under the dominion, the dominion of Satan and in his kingdom. Uh, now, I recognize that at this point, someone may say, well, I wasn't there, so how can I be charged with what Adam did? Listen, we've looked at that in detail. Suffice to say, the reality that is, uh, if any one of us had been there as Adam, we would have done the same thing. We would have done what Adam did. And someone may say, well, that isn't fair. But here's the thing. If God were only fair, it would have all ended with Adam. It wouldn't have only excluded them from the garden. He would have done away with man altogether. There would be no human race. It's because God is not only just, but loving and forgiving that man, that, that man can be saved at all. Praise the Lord. Now, I'm, I'm fully aware of the magnitude of what Paul is saying here, that, that it, it defies our human reasoning at times, beyond human comprehension. I sometimes, as I think about it, think, how can all this be? What I do is take it by faith because that's what God's word says. Like, for example, when Habakkuk couldn't understand what God was doing, and ultimately he had to bow and say, as he does in chapter 3, verse 17, though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, though the, the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the herd and there be no full herd in the stall, and there uh, uh, yet, he says, yet in spite of all that, yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. He didn't get it all, but he was going to rejoice in the Lord anyway. What we don't understand, we accept by faith. Listen, this is crucial. What we don't understand, we accept by faith based on the nature and the character of the one who has revealed himself to us. This is so important. It is only mankind who defies God and says, I don't understand, I don't believe, because it doesn't make any sense to me. It's only man in his arrogance and pride, dominated and ruled by Satan that says that. But when we come to know the Lord, when we begin to know the nature and the character and the love of God and how gracious and compassionate he is, as we look at going back into chapter 5, verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. As we begin to discern and understand the things of God, then do we accept by faith what he has said. Praise the Lord. Another example of this is the example of the right response is when Abraham was pleading with God for Sodom and Gomorrah, when he said, will not the judge of all the earth do right? When we know God's nature and his character, we can rest in that knowing that that which we don't seem to comprehend, we don't have the ability to get in our heads. We trust God because of who he is, because of his love, and he will only do that which is right. Amen.
Well, let's talk then about the evidence of sin. Verses 13 and 14. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Basically, Paul's argument is this. History verifies that death is universal. Before the law came, sin was in the world. Man's failure to meet the standards of the law was not counted against them, yet death reigned. Why? Because men still sinned. Remember in Genesis 6, he talks about, uh, about the flood, and he said that it came because violence Violence was dominating the hearts and the lives of men, and they only were conceiving of evil all the time. So there was sin, and the result was death. It wasn't because of man's sinful act and breaking the law of Moses, which they didn't have, but because of their sinful nature. That's the reason that death came. So because of, because of that, they were, from Adam to Moses, subject to death. Paul's overall point is that the entire human race remained under death and sin whether under the law or not, because death reigned. Okay, now I recognize when we come to a passage like this, there are lots of questions that are arise. Uh, I've had questions too. Uh, we're, we're not alone in that. Bible scholars and theologians have wrestled with these questions for centuries. Amidst all of those questions, I believe that there are some things that we can pull from this that we can ab be absolutely sure of in, in our trusting God in all of this. First of all, the Bible does teach that men are sinners both by nature and by choice. Everyone born of human parents inherits Adam's sin nature. The fact that we choose to sin is proof of our Adamic nature. Secondly, we know that the wages of sin is death. The death, that death is both physical and spiritual. The thing most important is that the death one suffers spiritually is eternal separation from God in hell. And that we know from scripture as well. That's the bad news about it. That's the bad news. But before we need to have the good news, we need to know the bad news. So the good news then is that no one has to pay the penalty for their sin unless they choose to at a cost that we can't even begin to calculate. God sent his son. Jesus willingly came to die as the substitute for sinners like you and me. Salvation for sin and its wages is offered as a free gift through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to anyone. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. So, mankind is condemned on two grounds. Adam's sin that is imputed to him. And secondly, we are sinners by practice. We have chosen to do that. The crowning guilt is our refusal, our refusal, our rejection of the provision which God has made for our salvation. That's the worst thing. We reject the free gift. Beyond that, we can rest in the assurance that the judge of earth, of all the earth, will only do that which is right concerning every human being. He will never act unjustly or unfairly. All his decisions are based on his equity and righteousness. That doesn't mean that certain situations pose problems to a hard dim sight. They are not problems to God at all. We may not understand. We may not get it fully, but it's not a problem with God. When the last case has been heard and the doors of the courtroom swing shut, no one no one will have a legitimate basis for appealing the verdict. In fact, there will be no court of appeal. It will be settled finally, once and for all. And when I read in Revelation, the books were open. Oh, what an ominous thing. Or that the books are closed. It's done. It is over at that point. Therefore, Paul says, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all have sinned. We were there, you and I, guilty before God. And without the redeeming blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, there would be no hope for all of mankind. So when we, when we reduce it all from there, it comes down to only a single question that we must all answer. What have we done about our sin?
Have you rejected the Lord Jesus Christ and the provision that God has made through the shedding of his blood at Calvary? Have you been justified by faith? Have you recognized your need of a Savior because of your sin? Have you repented and received Christ as your Lord and Savior, asking God to forgive you? Have you, have you turned to him and are you living for him? Are you walking with him, looking forward to the, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? Death no longer a fear, no longer a concern, a concern to you because you know where you're going? That's the question we have to answer. I'm so thankful for the day when I recognized my need, when I knew that I was a lost sinner heading to hell and Jesus came and saved me. He washed me of all my sin, made me a child of God. So even though we see all of these things, though mankind has, con has been and continues to be ruined by sin, sin ruins the life of each and every individual, and it's our sin that separates us from God. But if we will recognize, repent, and ask God to forgive us and receive Christ as our Savior and Lord, we know that we can walk in a relationship with the God of the universe. Praise the Lord. I pray that if you are listening today that you, and you've not made that decision, you'd make that, that you would just simply pray and ask God to forgive you of your sin, repent of your sin. Say, Lord, I am a sinner in need of your grace. I recognize that I have offended you by breaking your law. And I ask, Father, in Jesus' name, to be forgiven. And the promise of Scripture is, is that God will forgive and he will cleanse you from every sin. Praise the Lord for that hope. And I'm thankful for that. So if you haven't done that, do that. And if you are a Christian today, you know the Lord, continue to walk with him, continue to be in his word, continue to seek the Lord and to trust him in all things and believing in him and walking by faith in all the things that God speaks to us in his word. Amen. May the Lord richly bless you, I pray in Jesus' name.